Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of BIMP Your Live. I am your host, Nicolas Catelier. I am an architect, a BIMP specialist, and the founder of Revit Pure and BIMP Pure. Uh, today, we have a special episode about Revit MEP families. But before introducing the guests and moving on with today's topic, uh, well, first, if you're watching live, you can type in the chat where you're watching from, as usual. Always fun to see where people are from. We got uh, Rickard from Sweden. Uh, and other people in the chat. We've got uh, Mela from Barcelona. Okay, so while that's going on, a few things that I want to mention. Uh, nope, not this. Okay, so l last month we've released the new BIMPure website. It's a new subscription-based website that includes multiple courses and downloads, live master classes, uh, the launch has been a huge success, so thank you so much to all the subscribers, people who paid. And if you uh, didn't join BIMPure yet, you can find out more at BIMPure.com. So if you're a subscriber, this is what you will see. we will get access to all the Revit courses, the basics, design, manage, and the new one, which is called Heroic Families, as well as the downloads, which includes a pro template, Dynamo scripts, collection of families, it does also include access to the live community, as you can see here. And the community is very fun. People are asking questions and we are we discuss topics such as uh, families, so you can get support uh, about topics covered in all the different courses. And also, as you can see here, there's a tab that's called Meetups. These are private lab, live master classes for BIMPure subscribers only. So. Uh, we're going to have a second round of this live event that's going to be for private subscribers uh, where Ryan, today's guest, is going to talk. He's going to clarify later what he's going to talk about. But I think it's going to be about using manufacturer families inside for your MEP models, the right way to do it. Uh, all right, so that's at bimpure.com to access uh, all of the course. And uh, something else that is interesting with this new Herrick Families course we're constantly adding new content based on the questions we have from the audience. Uh, you can see there's, well, the first, there's the case studies where any interesting families, I might create a tutorial for it. And also Q&A and bonus tips. For example, we've released a tutorial about using ChatGPT to find Revit family formulas and about topics such as the directionality of reference planes. And all the past recordings of live master classes are available here as well. We have had uh, four live events so far. You can watch the recording right there. And something else before moving on, this is the new uh, BIMPure admin portal. So some people are using the BIMPure content to train their team, uh, mostly with Revit at the moment. So we have Revit beginners training. And now we've just released, this is fresh out of the oven, the admin portal. So if you're in charge of training at your firm and you want to train 20 people, for example, you get access to group discount. Like each extra user in the same organization is much cheaper. So you can get started here. It's at portal.bimbure.com. You create an account. You say how many users you want to train. Then you can add users to the Bimpure platform, remove them, update the pricing, and so on. Okay. And uh, the next episode of BIMP Your Live is going to be on March 27. So is that two weeks, three weeks away from now? And it's going to be with Stepan uh, Mikulic. Uh, I've been following Stepan on social media and has been killing it. He has just started his own company called AI and uh, AEC. He used to work at Big Architects. So this next session is going to be all about artificial intelligence. Okay. And let's now do a, a giveaway. So we're offering uh, a chance to win one year of uh, BIMPure. So let me just activate in the dashboard over here.
Okay, so let's do, 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 do the giveaway. Sorry, let me just bring up. Uh, the sheet. So just type in exclamation mark raffle in the chat and you will be added for a chance to win one year of subscription to BIM Pure. So type in exclamation mark raffle in the chat. So I'll keep that going for a while and then we can pick the winner. Okay, okay, so give me a sec here. Today's guest is Ryan Schalk. Ryan is based in Virginia Beach, USA. He is a lead senior plumbing design engineer, and he also has a YouTube channel called MEP Guy, and he also has a website where you can buy his Revit for MEP courses. So welcome to the show, Ryan. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going, Nick? How you doing? It's going great. I'm doing well. What about you? I'm doing all right. You know, busy, busy. MEP firms are always busy. So, um, you know, it's been fun, though. It's been a good spring. Well, it's not spring yet, but. Uh, all right. I'll ask the same question I typically ask all of the guests. How did you get started in uh, BIM? How, how did you get interested? Well, you know, when I first started, um, you know, engineering, I'm a mechanical engineer at a college. Um, and when I got to my first firm, which was my second career, uh, I was really interested in Revit because it was 3D modeling and I was super excited to actually get paid to model. Um, and so I was always very interested in the program, but I realized that it was extremely difficult. And so obviously I went on YouTube and tried to find out how to use the stuff. And there wasn't a ton of stuff out there. And so uh, one day I just kind of took it upon myself to start, you know, really trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, I got into the family editor, which I feel like is the gateway to learning Revit. Um, uh, I feel like get it, once you start creating families, uh, the sky's the limit. Um, but, you know, ultimately it was, you know, I was watching a lot of YouTube and I was like, you know what, I could probably show people how to do things on YouTube. So I just started there about two years ago. And then I launched a, a website got some courses on it. Um, and then, you know, just been going from there and teaching people, but also uh, still, you know, on my day to day job, you know, as a plumbing designer and engineer, you know, helping architects and uh, owners build their stuff. Uh, yeah, and I, I've got to say, like the, the amount of time I've been asked the question, hey, your content is great. Can you also create uh, MEP content? It's like, sorry, that's not really my specialty. <laughs> like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been asked that so many times, and it, it's I'm starting to see a bit more of it, especially as uh, for by people like you. But it, I don't know why, like there was not never been as much MEP content as there are architecture content. Well, you guys did. I feel like start before us. I feel like you guys adopted Revit way before MEP firms, mm -hmm. and I think yeah, we're just true. like trying to catch up. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. You know, the, the way we do things is definitely a lot different. I mean, the software with Revit is kind of different for everybody. I mean, even mm -hmm. between the trades, it's different for plumbing, mechanical, electrical, but also architectural. And so um, I just think we're lagging. You know, you guys figured everything out. And then the MEP firms were just supposed to figure it out. And we're still in that stage. That's why I love helping people learn because um, there's not a ton of information out there. And there's a lot of different opinions on how to do things. But it's all about like what makes sense for your firm and what makes sense for you. And so I love to find ways to simplify everything because Revit's challenging enough that I feel like finding simple ways to do things is, is ultimately my goal. Uh, yeah, all right, we'll quickly move to, so we can see your screen. But first is a question uh, from who was asking that. Someone is asking, yeah, Vinicius asking, is Ryan joining the Herrick Families course? So just to clarify, you're coming for a private session for the BIM Pure subscribers on March 20th. When is that? Is that two weeks from now? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I'll be talking about, um, you know, using manufacturer's content. Um, you know, as MEP firms, we're, we're also, you know, we, we talk to reps a lot and we get their content, their families. 
And there's a there's a strategy for using that. Obviously, I'm sure architects have heard of over, you know, families that are too big, uh, they can blow up your model. But also, like, how do we use some of the parameters that they're providing us? What is the right ways to do things? So we're going to talk all about that because it's an extremely important topic. Uh, all right. So I see that the raffle is in that just before we, we move on to uh, so you can see your screen. Let's pick the winner. Oh, so the winner is uh, Liz Sinclair. So Liz Sinclair, if you want to send an email uh, at nick at bimpure.com, send an email, say, I just want to raffle for a one year of Bimpure and I will grant you access uh, for one year after the show is over, of course. So congrats uh, to Liz. All right, so uh, back to you, Ryan. Let's move to uh, your screen so we can now see the uh yeah okay this is the powerpoint slides all right let me know when you can see it are we good yep yeah, all good all right all right cool all right so mep families and revit uh i'm starting with the powerpoint because i feel like that makes everything professional so we're gonna <laughs> go with that um i got the mountains in the background here because uh the families are the foundation of everything in revit but it was actually just a template file so it looks cool <laughs> uh what what are good families? And I've heard you talk about this, Nick, a little bit. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about what makes a good family. Uh, one, lightweight. So you don't want the file to be too big because you're gonna put a lot of these in your model. So number one is probably make the families lightweight. Um, I've also heard you talk about this is make them easy to use. So if you're gonna make, if you're like a BIM manager or you're like me and you're making families for other people, Make them easy to use. Don't like put all these extra parameters in that nobody knows what's going on. Um, make it user friendly. Um, yeah. One is customized. And, and what I mean by that is just make sure the family is doing what you need it to do. So when you're designing a family, think about like, what is this for? You know, there's when, when you start to answer that question, you can, you know, you can build it a certain way depending on what it's for. Um, so if you're a contractor, you really want to see everything. You want the connectors to be right. If you're an architect, you care about visuals. You care about what it looks like in the model. As an MEP guy, you just really care about the connectors. Do they have the right, you know, flow values, all that kind of stuff. So we don't really need to be as advanced, but it just, it really depends. Uh, and also parametrics. So you want your families to be able to turn into new families. So you can create all kinds of different types, um, all that. So do you have any, uh, what makes a good family, Nick? Yeah, well, I've, in a sense, I'm wondering if it's uh, similar, how similar is it to our architecture? Because uh, I've never really built a specific ME MEP family. So I'm wondering if all of these still apply to MEP. I guess most of it do. Yeah, I think the biggest one is the you don't really care about the color. I don't care about the color. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. really care. And, and I'll, I'll show you later is that like sometimes I just want to turn my families off so they don't because, you know, Architects put plumbing fixtures down. Do I need to show a plumbing fixture on top of yours? Probably not. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, what are bad families? Okay, it's pretty much the opposite of what I just went over. They're heavy, they're huge. Like the files are way too big. I, I've heard the story, I forget who it was. I think it was Jeff from uh, uh, BIM After Dark said like there was a bowl of M&Ms or something on the table in one of the models and it just completely crashed everything. I don't remember who said that, but it was something like that. So one of the Revit gurus out there. Um, complicated. So, you know, if there's too many parameters, you know, all these kinds of uh, instance parameters, you don't know what's going on. You don't know how the heck it works. It's just too complicated. Uh, made by others. So again, if you're getting families off the internet, be careful. Uh, I just wouldn't do it. I, I mean, I recommend everybody just kind of learn how to build simple families. Uh, just make your own families. You don't need to get stuff off the internet. It's usually not gonna be good uh, and rigid. So basically if they're not parametric, they're rigid. They're just, they're, they're it, that's it. Um, it would be nice to be able to flex some of the, some of the things, but you know, it, it really depends, but yeah, they're rigid. They don't really flex. So any other uh, bad family advice? Uh, I'm wondering if you have like the same problem as we do with manufacturer content of imported geometry and inside of Important. MEP families, which makes kind of the family super heavy, which causes the graphics yes. to be quite yeah. slow. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, you know, we'll go over some things, but yeah, you should always kind of like go into it, especially as a BIM manager, you should, you should always be telling your people like, don't just put this in the model, give it to me first. Let me clean it up. You know, there's tools to do that. And then maybe we could use it, but I'm also going to talk about different strategies for, for using that kind of content where you might not even have to, to go that far. So. There's a question from Ryan Saladzi asking, what are the biggest things that make families heavy? What are your thoughts on that from the MEP side? I, I think it's a lot of like uh, manufacturers modeling like so much detail, like the bolts, they'll be modeling like all the little thingies. Every little thingy or every little geometry or whatever you want to call extrusion is going to cause more uh, you know, file size. So, and then also parameters, right? So if you add a ton of parameters and everything's linking formulas, all kinds of stuff, it's just like, it just bogs it down. So we want to simplify that, especially if it's manufactured content, we don't really need it to be parametric, right? We really just need it to be it. <laughs> That's why we should build our own families that are parametric so we can, we can use those in our models. And then at the end, if we really need to bring in manufactured com content, we'll talk about how we can nest it in. Yeah, I, I might add, uh, Ryan, that I think there's we should distinguish a family that is heavy and a family that is slow, and it's not necessarily the same thing. A family that is heavy okay. tends to have uh, a lot of complicated geometry, and a family that is slow, sometimes it's, there's a lot of formulas, there's a lot of levels of nested family, and, but it's not necessarily right, right, heavy, right. but it might be slow if you change some of the dimensions. Gotcha, gotcha. Good distingu distinguish. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so why do I have a dandelion on this slide? Well, I don't really know, but I heard this thing from like Alan Watts. He's like a philosopher guy. And he said there's like there's like beauty and simplicity. And I, he said like a little dandelion with a little seed. Like there's actually a lot of intelligence in this little, you know, little seedling that has a little, you know, a little floaty wing. And, and so like, I like to think about when I'm building families again, what is its purpose? And can I, how simple can I make that family to do complex things? And so uh, this is just a good illustration of you don't necessarily need to build a helicopter or an airplane to, to travel, maybe just use the wind, um, s simplify things. Um, and then to say that we'll go the other way. <laughs> K-I-S-S. Uh, <laughs> I saw this, one of my favorite shows is The Office. And so I first heard it there, but I actually think it's great advice when you're in Revit in general. Uh, keep it simple, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, great advice, hurts my feelings every time. So um, just keep it simple, especially when you're starting off uh, building families. You don't need to overcomplicate it yet. Um, if you wanna get advanced, you can, but keep everything simple and good things will happen as you get better. All right, here we go. The standoff. MEP versus architectural families. So what is the main difference between MEP versus architectural families? What do you think? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I guess that's what we'll learn. Uh, I guess that's what we'll learn. Yeah, today. you'll learn it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you've Other said, maybe... Other than they're just better. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe there's a bigger focus on like the graphic side in the architecture, something that you've right. mentioned. Like architects are extremely picky about the way things look in a set of drawings. So that's yep. whenever I build families for an architect, I'm always careful like to make graphics um, very good. Else, I know I'm going to get complaints. Yeah. So the the main difference is actually pretty pretty simple. And if you go in the Revit library of the uh, families that come with Revit, you'll see pretty quickly what the main difference is. And it really is connectors. So MEP families have these things called connectors. And what they do is basically they have flow information or they could have electrical information that we use in our families to basically transfer data from one family through ductwork or through piping or through wire to a different family. So it's that way we transfer information that makes an MEP family uh, different than an architectural family where you don't really need connectors. Um, so let's, we'll talk a little bit about how these connectors kind of work. Um, they allow us to transfer data, especially, you know, we're doing BIM, BIM information modeling. So that information is getting transferred um, and it's being through usually, you know, ductwork or piping. Um, and here's a little example, and we're gonna do it in Revit 
And I'm going to kind of show you like just we're going to start from complete scratch and how this all works. But basically you have little connectors here and, you know, your flow is coming out and going into this one. And this, you know, air terminal or this air handling unit knows the flow of each one based on uh, the flow information that's going through these connectors. So that's the main difference. Uh, starting, um, not quite today, but by the time most people probably watch this video, um, I have a new family uh, masterclass on my website, mepguy.com. So if you're interested in building MEP families, you want to learn all the tips and tricks, um, we have a ton of content in this course that's coming out. I hope to have it out by tonight, but by the time most people watch this, you'll be able to uh, get it. I'll try to pin it in the comment once it goes on YouTube uh, so you guys can get access. Um, OK, and for everybody watching and, um, you know, we have a I'm going to have a little MEP building blocks template for you guys. So we're going to we're going to open up Revit and we're going to use these little building blocks. I'm going to have these free on my website that you can download and kind of um, I would, you know, if you're watching this later, download them and follow along with me. And it's a really good exercise for starting to learn how to build MEP families. And I was going to do a giveaway, too. I know, Nick, you already did one. Um, but if you're watching this on YouTube after it's live or now, I don't even know how that works with comments. But if you comment below uh, when the YouTube video comes out and you like this video, um, just comment the the families you would like uh, you know me to build, and I'll do some videos on them. Um, so I'm going to pick two people. I'm going to pick one which like who lists some cool families and be descriptive of like what kind of families you think I could build. And then also I'll just pick somebody random that comments um, down below uh, to get free uh, my free MEP masterclass. So once this goes on YouTube, comment below and I'll pick some people um, and we'll do something like that. Sound good? Yeah, it does. Yeah, All right, so like absolutely. this video. All right, guys, uh, let's uh, let's get into Revit. Do you have any questions, Nick, before we rock and roll? No, let's go. All right. Oh, one thing, my uh, shameless little plug. Here's my little website here. So if you want to buy uh, some families, we have some mechanical families. We have some plumbing families. Um, I'm trying this year to really focus on building families for people. And obviously, we have courses, too. So you can check all those out at my website, mepguy.com. So all right, let's get rocking and rolling. All right, let's get out of here. All right, we can see my screen, Revit. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you guys uh, go to go to my website, you can download this for free. I'll make sure to have it uh, for you guys. So let's start building some families. So these are, I didn't want to get in too much of the nitty gritty of building families, but essentially these are like building blocks that you can use. And I like to think that every family kind of starts with a box because once you learn how to build a box, you can pretty much start to build most things. So these are just what, what I call them is, um, I got this from Paul Aubin, but he calls them seed families, but it's basically like a family that you can use to build more families. So let's start, we're gonna start by using this little type box. And if you wanna open a family, you can go up here and edit family, or you can just literally double click this. So I can double click this family and it opens up in a 3D view. So we can take a look at this. And what I've done already, and the reason I like to use these little building blocks is because they have all of my little parameters already in them. So I don't have to really do this every time, but essentially we just have some reference planes, we have some dimensions and it's all parametric. So if I go back to my 3D view and I click on the family types button, you can see we have just these little parameter values. So if I wanna change the width to two feet and then hit apply, I can do it. And anytime you're building families, you want to be flexing your family as you go. Don't try to build a ton of stuff and then see if it works later. Flex it. Make sure that everything's working correctly. All right. So let's make this thing two by two. That looks good. And make it four foot. Well, actually, you know what? I forgot. I was going to build an air terminal first. So we're going to build a little air terminal. So I'm going to do one by one. And then the height, I'm going to change to one inch and click OK. All right, you do like you, this air terminal, Nick? Do, do you always start from uh, the generic family, uh, generic model of category? I usually do, um, but we're going to change that. Thank you for yeah, reminding exactly. me. Um, yeah. So I'm going to, before I continue, I'm going to save as. So let's just save this as a new family. 
And let's go back one, we'll create a new folder, call it BIM Pure. And then we're gonna save this as a uh, supply diffuser. Hit save. All right, this is my supply diffuser. Architects are not gonna like this, but that's okay. There's just for us, all right? So since ME, we're building MEP families, let's, uh, let's go ahead and add a duct connector. So here's what makes MEP families MEP. Um, we have these little connectors up here. So if we wanna put some duct on this, we click the duct connector button and you can see we could select a face or a work plane. So I'm gonna select a face and we're just gonna select the back of this little extrusion and click. And right away, you can see that a little connector pops up. I'm gonna hit escape and I'm gonna select it. So let's take a look at the properties of this connector. So we have the shape, it's rectangular. You could also change this to round. So I'm actually gonna use the round one. And when I do that, you can see that the height and width grays out and the diameter shows. So if I go back to rectangular, I can you know mess with this, but I, I wanna do the round. So let's do that. And let's just make this thing, I don't know, six inches. That sounds about right. All right, so that was easy. We changed the connector. Um, but now um, let's talk about this arrow right here. So do you, do you know what this arrow means, Nick? Uh, not quite sure about it. So what this arrow is saying is which way my duct is going to start mm -hmm. coming out of this thing. So if you want your duct to be going up, you want the arrow to be going up. If you want it to be going down, you're going to have to flip this guy and make sure it's going down. So that's the duct direction. Now the airflow direction is a little different. So if you see over here, first, you always wanna start off with your system classification. So set that right. So we can set that to anything we want. We're gonna use supply air, and then we can set our flow direction. Now the flow is gonna be coming, I don't know, I'll let you guess, is it in or out? Uh, is, is it going out? So it's actually going in. Now that's mm -hmm. a, a tricky one because it's an air terminal. You would think the air is coming out of it, but the from the duct, it's actually coming into duct. this yeah. connector. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, from the duct. So uh, you can think about it as the flow of data. Like where is the airflow coming from? It's coming from the duct, which is going into this connector. So we're gonna set it to in. And then right here, calculated. So you can do calculated preset or system. We're gonna set it to a preset value. So what that means is I can kind of control the value, okay? And we'll talk about connected or calculated a little bit later. Then I have this little flow down here. So I'm gonna leave it zero for now. And we're just gonna load this guy into the project. I have way too many projects open. We're gonna use this MEP family building blocks. Overwrite the existing, oh boy. Well, I thought I deleted it. <laughs> I'm gonna delete it. Now, let's see, hold on. So it's air terminals, supply. Oh, did I, for oh, I forgot something. All right, so we forgot to set this. So if we go to family categories right here, before we load it into the project, we need to set it on the correct family category. So I guess I'm glad I made that mistake because it happens. So I'm gonna click okay here. We're gonna load it back into the project and click okay, overwrite the existing. And then now if we go up to systems, air terminal, we have our little supply diffuser. And the now, connectors like... the connectors that you did place, does it need to be an MEP family or even a joint model family you can place a connector? You can place a connector on any kind of family, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I'm not positive, but you can do it in the generic Most models for sure. And okay. then I, you know, and anything else. So let's go ahead and place some air terminals. Let's just do them way down here. So I'm going to do two, just like that. And then I want four. So I'm just going to hold control and we'll do four just like that. All right. So we got these. So let's open up a 3D view. So I'm going to go to view 3D and we got everything looking good. So we got these. So let's go ahead and create an air handling unit. Oh, one thing before I start, you can see that these guys are on the ground and that's not really great. So we also, and this is why I like to have a project open when I'm building families, cause it's like, it triggers all these things. Okay, so let's go back to view one. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna kinda make sure these don't go on the ground every time. We wanna at least put them up a little bit. So what we can do is we can go to family types and you can see this default elevation right here. Let's set that to eight foot. 
That way, when they get loaded into the project, um, they automatically are at eight foot. So I'm gonna go load into project, hit okay, overwrite the existing and the parameter values. And then if we go back to our 3D view, I'm not sure if they will be up yet because we just did that. But if I go here, elevation from level, I can set it to eight. But when we create new ones, it should uh, come in at eight foot because that's the default. All right, so now we got this. I'm gonna move it down a little bit so you guys can see this a little better. All right, let's start building an air handling unit. So I'm gonna go back to this family right here, double click into it, and then we're gonna create an air handling unit. So let's first change the it to mechanical equipment right here. Hit okay. Let's change the geometry of this thing. Let's go, uh, let's go width. So anytime you want to do like one foot six, so you can do one space six enter. It just helps. I always show that little trick because I didn't learn it. And when I did, I was like, oh my God, it saves so much time. So width, depth, one foot six, and then the height, we'll just make it four feet and click apply. All right, there's our air handling unit. So let's do the same kind of thing. We'll go up to duct connector and we'll just place it at the top right there. Um, so one thing about this is that the connector is always going to be placed in the middle of the face that you pick. So in this case, we definitely want that. So everything's good. All right, let's click the connector. Um, we have the same settings over here. We're going to set it to supply air. Now this time we want it to come out because the airflow is going out of the system into the duct, okay? All right, so everything's good. Let's load it into the project. And I think it's on supplier, yep. Load it into the project. Oops, I forgot to save it. So let's hit file, save as family, AHU, hit save. Load it into the project, select the correct one. And I'm just gonna throw it right here. All right. Do you have any questions? Uh, looking good so far. There are some questions, but they're more general. So we will we can wait a little bit. All right. So here's a little uh, trick for everybody, uh, hopefully for the MEP guys over, out there. Um, anytime you're like creating MEP stuff in Revit, Revit like MEP is all about systems. Okay. So if you can start tracking systems, you're gonna, you're gonna go really far in this software. So let's create a system. And so we want all of this stuff to be a part of a system. So I'm gonna select all of it. And you can see when I do that, it creates, you can create a duct system up here, okay? So I'm gonna click the button and you can see right away, it's gonna say, okay, you wanna create a duct system, but what do you wanna put it on? Now Revit, if we click the drop down, it only has supply air. And the way it knows it's the supply air is those connectors that we put on them. So if you have multiple connectors on your equipment or your air terminals or something, Revit's gonna pick up all of those different systems. But since we only put supply air, we only have the supply air system. So we're gonna click okay. And now we've created a system, all right? Pretty easy. So now what you can do is pretty cool is we can generate a layout based on this system. So if I click this button, Revit will create this layout for us for, for the ductwork, all right? And so we can kind of go through, it has some automatic solutions up here, so we can kind of cycle through these. And I don't really like that one. That one looks pretty good. So we can kind of just cycle through these and let's select this one. So let's say I like that one. I can literally just hit finish layout. Uh-oh. Do you know do you know what's going on Nick? I don't. <laughs> oh, it just yelled at me. Hold on. Let me let me do that again. All right. So, beginners in Revit are going to get this a lot. And so I just want to go over it. All it means is that there was not enough room to put this little elbow fitting, okay? So, anytime you're an MEP, just know that when you have it, Revit's yelling at you, it's usually cuz it doesn't have enough space to put the required fittings, okay? All right. So, to fix this, let's just undo and before we finish this off, let's move this ductwork up so it works. So let's go back to solutions and we can hit settings up here and we can set how, how tall we want this. So I'm gonna set it to 10 feet this time, make it a little taller, hit okay. And then we'll go through our solutions again. So I liked that one right there and let's finish it. All right, there we go. 
So now we're starting to rock and roll. Now, I don't really love this square ductwork or this, yeah, this uh, rectangular ductwork. So to change it, we can just hover into or tab into everything, filter out the mechanical equipment and the air terminals. So we only have the ducts and the fittings. And we could just change the type up here. So let's just change it to, I don't know, let's go with the T's. And look at that. That looks nice. All right. You following me? Yeah, looking good. All right, so that was pretty easy, right? Revit, Revit's not that hard. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start to see how these connectors in the airflow tracks throughout our little system here. So if we click on the duct, we're gonna scroll down and you can see there's actually some mechanical flow properties over here. So right now there's nothing going on, it just says zeros. So what we need to do is we need to set the connector to a specific airflow. So let's go back into our family and let's go to the connector. So I'm gonna to go to a 3D view and let's set this airflow. So you can see there's this little flow parameter over here. Let's set that to, I don't know, hundred, hit enter. And now what we've done is we've set the airflow. So let's load it back into our project. Okay, overwrite the existing version. And now if we click the duct, you can see that we have a hundred CFM, okay? So you can see that the connector's already starting to push air, you know, or pull air, sorry, into our little air terminal. So if we have here, we have 100, we could check here, we have 100, and if we go here, we should have 200. Everything's working. If we go here, we should have 400. Everything's working, okay. So what's cool about setting airflows is now we can start to tab into stuff and we could use the duct pipe sizing tool and we can size the ductwork based on those airflows. So that's why it's like important. That's why MEP connectors are cool because we can use some of the things that save time, like sizing ductwork, uh, sizing piping, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, we could set this to different things. We could do friction. Let's just say, okay. And you can see Revit kind of sized this based on that setting I have. So this is all looking good. But what I wanna be able to do is change this flow value in here because right now, I don't have anywhere I can change this. And if I go to edit type, there's nothing here where I can change that. I have to literally go into my family every single time um, and update that airflow value. So I have to click on this, update it, and that's just not good, okay? But what if we assign this to a parameter value, all right? So anytime you wanna assign something to a parameter value, you have this little button right here. Right to the right of the parameter of flow, you have the little button, associate family parameter. I'm going to click it. And Revit has some options already, but let's create our own. So let's create a new parameter. And let's just make it an instance because I want to be able to control this parameter for different air terminals. They're not always going to be the same. Some One might be 100, one might be 200. So that's why we wanted an instance parameter. So I'm just going to name it airflow and click OK and click OK, and then let's just load it into the project. Overwrite the existing version. So now when I click on my little air terminal, look at that, I got a little airflow. So now I can just change it to 200. And then if I click on my duct, I got 200 CFM. And if we click on this one, so this one was 100 because we haven't changed it yet. And then I click on here, it should be 300. Simple enough? You following me? Uh, indeed. So I'm wondering, are you always using Revit to calculate the uh, the amount of air and for these kind of calculations? Because I saw both. I saw some people are just really muddling the geometry, but doing all the calculations and sizing in a different tool. Yeah, so you uh, a lot of MEP firms, they don't really have the airflows kind of like set up correctly. So mm -hmm. we're kind of still in the CAD days where it's yeah, just yeah. like, we're using text to assign everything. And then we use a duct dilator to kind of size our duct work. And then we just make sure the duct's the right size. But you don't have to do that because mm -hmm. you can let Revit be your sizing. And that's what's so powerful by starting to build these little simple families because you can start to use some of those tools that are already inside of Revit to do your calculations and really speed, speed things up for you, hopefully. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. And are most uh, MEP firms using uh, these tools, the, the flow calculation these days? Be because I remember I, I really seeing don't, a lot I really of them don't know. Really. Okay. I don't know. I, I would hope more are, but I, 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 hope so I too. have a yeah. feeling it's probably 50-50, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I really don't. I see. 
All right, so let's say we want to change all of these at the same time. So here's a little trick for, I hope people know. If you want to select all the same things in a view, you can right click it, select all instances, visible in view. And since I set it to an instance parameter, I can change all of these at the same time. So let's change them all to 200, hit enter. And then right here should now be 800. And look at that, we got 800 CFM. So now if I want to size this thing, hopefully if we size it to the same you know, technique, which was the friction, everything should get bigger, right? All right, so let's click OK and see what happens. Look at that. So it's just a very quick way to have more of a smart system and, and really start to model everything correctly inside of Revit and use some of the tools. So um, so that's good. But what what are these things? Like like you said, you need to be able to tag these things. Like we we don't we don't have any airflows tags. So let's start seeing if we can tag some of these airflows. So let's go ahead and uh, let's create a new tag. I'm just gonna hit the TG button. Actually, I'm gonna go to annotate. And what I'll do is I'll select all the air terminals and let's tag them all at the same time. So I'm gonna select them all. I'm gonna go to annotate, tag all. I gotta lock the view. So let's lock it first because it's a 3D view. We're just gonna call it 3D. If I wanna select the previous, I can. We can go to annotate, tag all, and we'll select air terminal tags. We'll use this diffuser tag and there we go. All right, so luckily the diffuser tag that comes right out of the box in Revit already has those little airflows. So the nice thing about the CFM thing is if we wanna change these airflows, we can actually do it right from the tag. So I can change this to 100 and you can see my airflow now is 100. If I wanna change them all, I can use that technique before where we you know, select all instances visible in view and I can change them to 300. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But now we're starting to really you know, be a little smarter with our design. So um, learning how to like manipulate these tags is also important for MEP because like the tags are, are you know, it's everything. Like the tags are our, our design really. So we wanna make sure we're also keeping an eye on the tags for all these little smart families that we're gonna be building. So let's modify this tag a little bit. So I'm gonna click on it, hit edit type. And I'm not a big fan of this little line. So we'll get rid of that. Um, I'm gonna do a little box. So let's just do, create this real quick. Let's do something like this. I'm just eyeballing it so you can make it a lot prettier if you want. But let's do something like that. I've seen firms use this kind of technique. And it was using the type mark. So if we go back to the 3D view, oh, it wasn't using the type mark, sorry. So right now this tag was using the mark value. And the reason I know that is because it's different for each one, but usually like an air terminal, you want all the one by ones to read like type A or something. So let's change this to type mark. So let's go back to our tag. So let's click on it, hit edit family. And then let's change this instead of, we're gonna edit the label. And what labels do is they essentially read information from the from the family. So it's going to read the mark value from that family, but we don't want to do that. So we're going to remove it. And let's just add the type mark. Okay. You can put a sample value in here. So if we like want to see what it would look like, you could put like A and then CFM is already 200 CFM. So that's perfect. So let's load this back into the project. Let's go MEP family blocks. We're going to overwrite the existing. Uh-oh. Something's wrong. Do you know what's wrong, Nick? Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> that was a great response. So um, we never we never updated the type mark for this. OK, so like if we go here and hit edit type, there is no type mark for these. So it's going to it's not going to register anything. But again, we can edit this uh, type mark through the tag, which is really helpful. So when I do that, Revit's going to say, hey, you're changing the type marks of all these elements. You sure you want to do that? Yeah. All right. So now we got a pretty cool looking, uh, you know, drawing here. Our architect's happy. Uh, he thinks we know what we're doing. So <laughs> we're doing a good job. All right. So uh, any questions so far? Yeah, there, there's a lot of questions. So I was wondering if we should <laughs> go, go to the list of questions Perfect. now or if you wanted to. Uh, I, I think we should split and take Let's a few of them. Yeah, let's split. Let's split because I have a couple more things and then, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me have a look. Well, there was something that I've also asked to talk about during the session from Tyler Nix okay. asking, can you discuss the benefits of using anything other than a phase-based template for MEP families? 
face-based template. Uh, okay, hold on. Reread re that. Sorry. Can you discuss the benefits of using anything other than a face-based template for MEP families? So it seems like Tyler loves using face-based families. What are your thoughts on face-based families okay, versus okay. non-hosted or workplane-based? Uh, okay, yes. Um, so I uh, hate face-based families. So let's just put it like that. Um, <laughs> And it's and it's simple because like I'm a plumbing engineer. So when I'm doing my plumbing design, I'm attaching things to walls, right? If I'm attaching to the walls and the architect decides to move all these walls all the time, it's just a nightmare to kind of manage. So I really don't like it because I don't have control of the walls. That's usually like my biggest, um, the biggest rule, in my opinion, is when you have control of your stuff that's going to be hosted to, then you mm -hmm. want to definitely host a thing. So like if I'm an architect and I'm putting a plumbing fixture on a wall, yeah, I want it to be hosted, right? Because I'm going to be moving my walls throughout my designs, all that kind of stuff. But as an MEP firm, we don't have any control of those walls or those anything, right? So when the architects make changes, it's just kind of a, a pain in the butt to have to mm -hmm. constantly just be monitoring those things and clicking things. And then our stuff moves when we didn't realize it and the piping breaks. There's like so many reasons to not do that because it's really, it's much easier when you guys move a wall that I can literally just select all my stuff and then move it myself. Cause I want I'm gonna probably have to do that anyway when you guys move something. So there's no really like advantage to that. Um, however, for, Electrical, you know, I could see some advantage to like hosting to walls because it's like if the architect moves a wall, then okay, maybe it's nice to have that little function. But I, I, what I've I, actually learned, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying I think one of the benefits of phase-based families is the that it automatically cuts cuts voids into elements that they are being hosted to. So is that a benefit yeah. that you, you find useful or not? So I actually talked to my electrical guy John um, and he's got his own YouTube channel you could check it out the electrical department but he's basically told me that that's the reason why you would want to host the things is to cut stuff like that so when he's doing his lighting calculations he's some he likes to do that stuff um, however I feel like there's a lot of firms out there that aren't using the models like that and so it really depends on again like what your family is is supposed to do like you always have to think about that if a light needs to cut a, uh, a ceiling, then you probably need the host to it, right? Um, so that's where I think you just draw, you decide like, do I want to host the things and or do I not? So I don't think there's a right answer. There's just obviously opinions. Um, but for plumbing, I would highly <laughs> recommend not hosting to anything. All right, sounds good. Uh, I see more questions, but uh, I think you could go, go through a little more. I see it's already 348. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here, I knew so that, I knew this can... was going to take some time, but yeah. I mean, this concept's kind of cool because it's really simple and yeah. it kind of starts to show you how like the flow of data is kind of being transferred. So let's kind of talk about two, let's do one more concept. And um, all, all this, by the way, is in the course where I go a lot slower and more detail. And I have four different project-based learning uh, examples like this, where we go through the whole process from like scratch. So it's a really cool way to learn. I love the project-based learning. Um, so let's talk about like this air handling unit should know how much air is coming into it, but there's no like way to know what that is. Like I'm looking over here. If I go to edit type, there's nowhere where it says the airflow. So let's try to figure out how we can get the air handling unit to know how much air is required for these air terminals. Okay. So let's go into our family. And remember, when I first told you guys about these little connectors, there was this flow configuration called calculated. Now, what calculated does is it actually calculates the airflow that's required for that connector. And so since we have the air terminals that are, you know, the ones that are controlling the individual airflows, we want to set this one to calculate it. And that way it'll just say, hey, whatever it is, it is. So right here, we're going to set it to calculated. And then for flow, we're going to assign that a parameter. And I'm going to hit new parameter here. Now, anytime you're doing calculated, you have to make it instance, OK? Because the calculated flows, they need to be able to change. All right, so we're going to set it to instance. And I'm going to say supply airflow. All right, hit OK, hit OK. Let's load it into the project. OK. 
overwrite the existing version. Let's click on our little air handling unit and look at that. So now we had 300 a piece. It's calculating the supply airflow for us. So that's pretty cool. All right. So now what I could do is I could use that value for maybe, I don't know, let's, let's take it even further. Let's add some return duct right here. So let's go to the family and let's add a return, uh, a connector. So pipe duct connector right there. Now, remember when I told you that, like, if you host to a face, it's kind of going to put it in the middle. So we're going to have to use a different technique. And I do have a little technique. I can probably, I thought I had it open. Let's see. There's my little connectors. I think I might have to go to my connector host rectangular. Here we go. I got this little technique that I, I've been messing around with lately and I really like it. And what it is, it's just a little face-based family. And I can just load this into my little families. So I'm going to load it into my air handling unit. And what I can do is I can just quickly, so I don't have to like, set a new extrusion or anything, I can just quickly place this on, a, on the face right here, which is really fun. And then what I can do now, unfortunately you cannot move connectors once they're placed, which would be nice if we could, like if there was a button up here where I could just, Hey, place this on this one. So once I set all that stuff um, over here, I can't just move it to another face. So I have to delete it. But now that I've deleted it, I can create a new one, duct connector, select this face, and there we go. Now, the nice thing about this little extrusion method um, in any extrusion is now I can just move this, this connector around as much as I want, where I can't really move this one. It's not going to let me move it. Okay. All right. Let's say I want the, to change the return, uh, you know, duct work to the front of this face. Well, I can hit this pick new button over here and now I could put it in the front. So this gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, for when I'm building families, okay? Now you might wanna assign this like a parameter that controls, you know, where this thing is. Um, so if we go to the right view, if we go quickly, I'm trying to go quick guys. Um, so I'm gonna just go over here. I'm gonna put it right there. And what you can do is you can like annotate or that's not what I wanna do. Modify, align, click this, and then click the center point. And you could lock it to that little dimension right there. And now we're like centered up. That's looking great. So let's set this connector. Let's set it to the return air. And here's the concept I wanna show you guys. So we have this one as a calculated flow. So it's taking the data from that duct. So it knows what it is. Now the return air, it really should just be equal to the supply air, right? So let's, let's click on this little connector and the flow configuration we're going to set to, well, first we have to set the flow direction. So the flow direction is going to be going into it because it's return air. So it's pulling the air in. So we'll click in. And then instead of calculated, let's just set it to preset. And then what we'll do is we'll sign this to a new parameter value call turn airflow. We're going to set it as an instance. Click OK. Click OK. And then let's click on our family types button. And now what we have is we have the parameters we just created that are from these connectors. Now the first supply connector is calculated. So it's taking that information, it's figuring out what it is. And then the return, let's just set it equal to supply. So let's select supply airflow. Return airflow should be equal to supply. Make sense? Click okay. And then let's load it into our project. Uh-oh, there it is overwrite the existing. We got, let's add some return, turn grill right here. So now we got, let's see, we got 1200 CFM. If we click on our air handling unit, we got 1200 CFM in the supply and the return is also 1200 because it's just equal. And then if we click on our return duct work, look at that, we got 1200 CFM. So we're literally tracking all of this information that started with our little air terminal all the way through the duct all the way through the air handling unit and into the return. So now we could literally size all of this duct with this little smart system we have set up. All right, there's the chat is extremely active. There's a big okay. debate and let's, let's discussion, questions. discussions about, about the, the, the hosted based. thing. <laughs> well, hosted yes. versus non-hosted because face-based, you can place them on linked models, right? 
But like okay. people are mentioning, well, sometimes we're not always using the link model. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So it's a bit unreliable to have phase-based families. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, th I think it's just the extension on what we talked about before is just, um, you know, if, if you don't control the stuff that you're hosting to, it's just going to be challenging. That That's really, it really all comes to that. So I know it's a huge debate in the industry. So um, <laughs> I, I like to stay away from hosting, but I understand if you like to host, I, I, like I said, I'm in the plumbing world, so I'm mostly doing plumbing. I, I get into obviously mechanical design a little bit. Um, I'm still learning. Um, but yeah. Um, people are, are wondering, why are you using Revit 2020? They're asking if- Oh, is... that's a good question. You know what? So if you're gonna be building families, I would recommend building them in a later version of Revit, just so they're compatible with everybody. For me, I have to build them for um, everybody. <laughs> and people still want families from like 2018. I'm like, I, I can't do it. So <laughs> I mean, I got to cut it off oh somewhere. <laughs> I got to cut it off somewhere. So usually I think four years is probably decent. Uh, most architects, they better have a template that is at least 2020, I would hope, or at least they're starting with their project. So as MEP firms, we're a, a lot later to the game. And so an architect could literally be like design a building and a year later, they give it to an MEP firm. So you have to be careful. You don't want to always build your families in the newest version of Revit. You kind of want to build them in the old version so you could update along the way. Yeah, something I, I might say about this is that uh, I've researched this a lot. Clients were asking me, okay, what versions of Revit should we support? And Autodesk officially supports four versions of Revit at the same time. So right now they're supporting 2021 to 2024. And so when yeah. 2025 is released, they will uh, stop supporting well, officially at least, 2021. Yeah. So, it, it, which means I typically build, like for example, on the Bimpure website, I build all families with Revit 2021. So they're available in four versions. But it, it's true that I did have a few people ask me, hey, do you have content for 2020, 2019? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, some people are, are going to be asking for it, but it's, uh, I mean, yeah. at some points, I like to use the more, more recent version. Already four years behind, it seems like a lot. Yeah. This is, um, I just want to kind of show off some things that we, we yeah. built at MEP guy. So this is like, like Tyler Disney. He also has a YouTube channel, uh, the BIM manifesto and he just yeah, built I think he's in the chat. Oh, nice. Nice. What's up, Tyler? So yeah, I had to show off his new airside pack cause it's super cool. And we have this new modular system kind of using that same box uh, system that I was showing you, but you know, this air handling unit right here is extremely modular. And so what it allows us to do is it allows us just like I was showing to move these things around. Um, so if you need to move the planes and stuff, you can just quickly do it. Um, and also all these little pipe connectors up here, they can just be moved around. So it's just a, it's a new thing like, like we've been messing around with, but we really like this idea of like having a very simple family and being able to manipulate it quick rather than like creating a thousand of these air handling units because they're so different for each manufacturer. It's really nice to early in the design to just be able to like use these things quickly and stop like waiting on manufacturers um, to get you uh, their families. Cause sometimes it can take some time and it's just, it's nice to just have your own families um, inside your firm. So this is something he built. Uh, let's see, I got the f plumbing family pack here. So this is the template that I built. It's basically made for copy and pasting into models. I have some layouts that are already done here that like you can quickly copy and paste into models. Um, this is kind of like a, a YouTube video I did the other day, which you know I was showing like um, how to use plumbing fixtures. One thing that was you you asked about is like how if the if the architect's going to be putting plumbing fixtures in the model, do you? Like, how do you control the visibility? Isn't that something you were curious about? Yeah, I remember you've asked me what so some good questions you could prepare for. One of them was how can architect prepare uh, their model? What do you like to see when you have a model from architects that makes your life more simple? Yes. All right. So that's a, like one of the big ones is if you're going to be, and especially for the plumbing trade, if you're going to be modeling like sinks and you're going to be using like casework, if you could still keep the plumbing fixture, plumbing fixtures would be nice because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of times, like I'll see sinks that are casework and it's like, 
it's nice to just be able to quickly um, schedule the plumbing fixtures to kind of see making sure I'm like correct. But if I have a bunch of casework families that are actually plumbing fixtures, it gets challenging. So I would just say like consistency would be nice to make sure that your your family categories are the same as what they should be. Um, but I understand there's probably reasons why you just make it casework <laughs> uh, or like a, a sink, a lavatory. Um, uh yeah, yeah, for sure. That happens a lot in, in families. Um, another thing is like, yeah. another thing is just, um, it's tricky to rely on the MEP firm to control visibility stuff or like the aesthetics. So if you're going to rely, like this is true for electrical or plumbing. If you're going to rely on the MEP firm to control the plumbing fixtures, that's just tricky. I would say like you still should probably be controlling all of your plumbing fixtures, getting them like the right fixtures for the model. And then the plumbing person like me, I'm just going to have little generic fixtures that I'm using. I'm not going to like I'm going to use the architect's fixtures as the visibility, but I'm I'm going to use my own little connectors and stuff that are super simple um, and then turn off my stuff for for the floor plans. And that's usually what I do is I literally um, if, if I open this model up, uh, oops, anyway, keep, keep asking questions. <laughs> I think that is locked. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got Tyler in the chat already, uh, answering some questions from, from the audience. So thanks. Thanks Tyler for okay, uh, being an cool. active chat chat member. I think there was a lot. I would have to, to scroll back up. So one thing I'll show real quick, um, yeah. is so the plumbing fixtures, I have a, a parameter or I have a visibility parameter in my model or in my plumbing families that allow me to control the visibility of it right here. So you can see that the plumbing fixtures are set to coarse, meaning they're going to hide mine. But if we set that to by view and hit apply, you can see how there's an overlapping going on right there, right? So what I do is I just go and set it to coarse and I have basically it just turns off my fixtures. So if I actually go into my fixtures, let me hit control Z here. Oh. Let me go over here. So I'm going to go into this family right here. And what I've essentially done, this is my family. So it's not like based on any kind of manufacturer stuff. It's like extremely simple, um, very simple. And what it is, is I have all of the visibility on a parameter right here. Oh, sorry. On a visibility graphic overrides. And you can see all the 3D geometry gets turned off when I set it to course. So that's how I can control just hiding my stuff in floor plans because I don't want it to do that overlap thing. So that's just a little trick that I that I do. There's a question from uh, Denny asking, Ryan said he would have an upcoming masterclass of his own and I'm wondering if it would be added to his course bundle if I already bought his bundle before his masterclass comes out. Oh man, <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but uh, it sounds like a good deal. Um, but, uh, uh, just send me an email, uh, let me know what, what you're talking about, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll figure something out. Okay. But yeah. I have, I obviously have courses at my site that you can uh, get and you can get all these fixtures and everything and all of our courses. I'm looking at the description of it that we had for, for the session. So we've had looking, lookup tables for valve fitting, nesting symbols and co controlling the visibility of annotations and using manufacturing. So obviously we won't have time to go to, to all of that. And yeah. of course, uh, shameless, shameless plug for the session we'll have together on March 20th and also for your content at uh, mepguy.com. And can you just give us a glimpse of what you mean by nesting symbols and controlling the visibility of annotations? Oh yeah, actually I have uh, that, that for you guys right here. Are you talking, uh, I think I'm talking about this. So. Um, I think what I was referring to is like, if you have a little electrical symbol right here. Yeah, it's not a tag. It's directly inside of the family, right? Yeah. So if I click on this little electrical family, and actually this is a good point because um, when you're building families, don't be afraid. I would always obviously start from the from scratch. And I, I have, I'll have a free mini course out on my website with those little box families um, to kind of show you how to build the geometry. But once once you understand some of the the basics, it's always cool to kind of go into the Revit stuff, like the stuff that Revit provides and hit edit family and see how they built their families. Cause they're actually pretty simple um, and they use some really, uh, pretty good concepts. So if I go into floor plans here and reference level, um, you can see that 
there's the 3D geometry of this little box, but there's also this little symbol here, okay? And so this symbol is actually nested inside of this family. So you can see we can actually open up this family and this is the family right here. So this guy is literally the family. So if I wanted to maybe flip this family, I could do it here. So let me just flip it, see if I can actually do it. But I don't want to copy. So I'm going to flip it. Let's just flip it about that point. Uh-oh. Yeah, there we go. And then we'll load it back into that little duplex receptacle. And then we'll overwrite the existing version. And look, I flipped it. And so this family, and then I can move it. Let's just move it back. I'm not using, <laughs> I'm not using good principles or anything. And then we can load it back into the project. Uh, I don't even remember which one it was. I think it was. Oh, boy. Um, Lots of projects oh. open. I get a problem yeah. with that. Don't, don't, uh, don't open you, too many projects. You need color tab. Don't you use that? No, I need to, I need to start though, don't I? Water <laughs> closet example. See, I can't even find. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. oh gosh. I can do this guys. All right. So load it into the project water. Cl it's not there, is it? Oh. No, well, I don't see it, guys. I'm sorry. But anyway, we flip this and we load it back into the project, which should be water closet example. Oh, here it is. Here we go. Override existing version. <laughs> there you go, guys. So um, being able to control the symbols uh, inside families is very important, too. Um, and there's a bunch of little different tricks you can do for getting these little symbols to work right. And obviously, these symbols are also um, you know, have their own visibility settings for whether they show up in, in the view or not. Um, so there's a lot that goes on with those. And that'll definitely be in my master class on how to kind of use symbols because it's for MEP, it's extremely important, and especially electrical. All right. So let me mention a few more things before we close this session. Let's move out to my screen right here. Once again, if you like this session, we've got a round number two with Ryan, where we're going to talk about some more MEP topics, such as using manufacturer equipment and taking some more questions. Since it's only for the subscribers, it's going to be a more intimate groups. So we'll be able to answer uh, more questions. And that is at, you can join at bimpure.com. And if you go to the library, you'll see the list of uh, events. And if you go to the Guardians community, there's a little tab that is called the meetups right here. And you can see the link, you can add the calendar, this event, and uh, on upcoming events, we'll add more soon, we'll be here as well. And then there's Ryan's website over at mapguy.com. Uh, so make sure to check this out. It's not only Ryan, but you work with a few other people. You've mentioned Tyler. Yeah. Who, who else is working with you? Oh, let's, uh, let's, let's bring them up. Hold on. Let's see if I can do this. So we have... Uh, Zan Ta, we got Tyler Disney and John Chan. And so if like you see my screen right here, yeah, uh, yeah. these are all the MEP guy team members. So uh, we all uh, chip in for the courses. We're still building, obviously, um, but we're, we're hoping to build a lot of cool families this year. Um, but we all we have courses too available at the site. Nice. So happy to see uh, more MEP content out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for the session. I'm looking at the chat to see if we missed something big, but you know what? We'll have a round two in, in two weeks. So uh, keep it up. And But don't forget, that Tyler, uh, uh, Ryan asked if that you post a name, a family that you want to see built. I already saw a few of them in the live chat. So if you're watching the okay. replay, you can type in the, the, the chat below the video as well. Yeah, make sure to like the video too, guys. Come on, let's spread this content. <laughs> thanks you know i typically don't don't even ask my, my folks like you're doing the. <laughs> <laughs> i'll ask for you <laughs> you're doing the channel growth for you're doing my job <laughs> that's right uh all right did i forget to mention something i think that's it something else ryan no. uh go over head over to bim pure and sign up for his uh family master class he has his own so uh if you get both of them you know you get the mep and the architectural you'll be pretty set so y you'll be that a, at Bimpier. you'll be a super you'll be unstoppable <laughs> that's right
<laughs> okay th thank you so much ryan thanks everyone in the chat for uh being active uh, members asking great questions going to have a round two uh yeah uh, maybe one last thing the next episode of bib your live so we have the live session for subscribers only with ryan uh, that is in two weeks in three weeks from now with uh, stepan mikulic uh an episode all about ai in aec that is in March 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So thanks a lot, Ryan. Thanks, everybody. And see you next time. Goodbye. See you, Nick.